About a year ago, after our Episcopal election here in Ontario, I was driving to St. George's in Laguna Hills for an appointment with our Pulitzer Prize winning Episcopal News correspondent, the Reverend Pat McCann, part of Janet Kawamoto's shop. And I knew what the conversation was going to be about. You had heard from all six candidates lots of visioning and lots of high tone proposals and concerns and, and notions about where we might go as a community of God. But I knew that Pat would ask me for a, shall we say, a, an overarching theme for the vision. And all I could think of was, everybody's got a hungry heart. Which, as you may know, is a Bruce Springsteen song. He is not known as a theologian, although he has some interesting insights on the life of the church in our time. If you were interested in perhaps seeing his June 1980 performance of the song in Phoenix, you go to the website for Diocesan Convention, and there you will find a brand new button. And it says, Outlines and Resources for the Two Bishops' Addresses. And click on it. You'll find an outline of my address as well as Bishop Bruce's address tomorrow, and including some resources that you might find useful. But once this notion had popped into my head, and since I just had eight minutes left to get to St. George's, Hungry Hearts was inescapable on this philosophical and musical hook. I have hung my brand new mitre. What Bruce, of course, is saying, and a lot of popular music and popular culture is about this, um, is about the, the universal unitive urge that we all have. We don't need to see it in theological terms, but it is the human imperative to engage in agape love. As the bishop preached a few hours ago, we are made to love and to be loved. It is just the circumstances of a broken world that deter us from being agape people. I must say, in reference to the graphic that was devised by Canon Bob Williams and his resident artist for Hungry Hearts, that, that um, it bears an uncanny resemblance to Stevie Wonder's album cover, his 1976 album, Songs in the Key of Life. It was unintentional. And Chris is going to take it down right away in case Stevie's copyright lawyer happens to be a member of one of our congregations. What we're hungry for, first of all, is a sense of ultimate meaning, of some purpose in the universe larger than ourselves. And I'm talking not just about us as people of faith, but all humanity is identified by poets and songwriters and everyone who sees in the human DNA a unitive urge, who sees our imperative for agape. Second, we are hungry to be part of communities of meaningful and nurturing relationship. The family metaphor comes to mind, places of abiding, non-judgmental, unconditional, accepting love. Third, we're hungry for justice when systems and prejudice oppress God's people. And we are all of us as created beings hungry for the basics of a dignified life, food and shelter, good and decent work with good and decent pay and benefits, health care, safety from violence, and the transcendent blessing of companionship. So looking at this human condition of being rigged for love, what is our God in Christ saying to our diocese in this time and place? This is our question 
each moment of our lives of faith and leadership in our communities of faith. It's the question that we'll be answering together as we move forward together in leadership in this diocese. We are in a secularizing time, are we not? We're in a time in which institutions, especially faith institutions, are in decline or are at least changing. But we understand, irrespective of faith and belief, that universal spiritual hunger remains and ever will. Now, as for our denomination, I don't suggest that you try this. You don't have to. You know what will happen. Go to Starbucks one morning, line up the first hundred customers, and ask them what Episcopal means. <laughs> then ask them to spell it. If we brought in a branding guru and paid $100,000 in uh, consultancy fees, the first thing she would say is, for goodness sake, lose the name. It is doubtful that any of you has ever encountered anyone in church whom you'd not seen before. And you ask that person why they were at your church, and that person said, I just woke up this morning feeling vaguely Episcopalian. We can talk about branding. We can make liturgical adjustments. We can literally worry ourselves to death. Or we can let our growth as a denomination in this diocese, in this place, should it come, and no one can guarantee that it will, be a consequence of our stubborn authenticity. Let us not be what the fickle spirit of the age tempts us to be, but what the eternal spirit of our God in Christ needs us to be in this time, in this era of anxiety, injustice, fear, and insecurity. Because remember, of all the things that we do, all the ministries that we do and the things that we celebrate today and tomorrow, we don't do any of these things merely for ourselves. We do it for those who aren't here yet, whose hunger isn't being assuaged yet, who don't even know they're hungry. We do what we do for the whole body of Christ, and we do it for the whole creation. So in a culture that is absolutely convinced that it has outgrown church, how are we going to be the church the world will inevitably realize it desperately needs? To answer these questions, first we have to turn inward a little bit. Our diocesan heart is hungry for a little TLC. We've been through a difficult time, both we and some who are absent, members of the congregation called St. James the Great in Newport Beach. A few weeks ago, their leaders in the diocese released a statement, which I know you have seen, called Making All Things New. And the gist of that statement, besides its acknowledgement that things have been done on both sides of a painful question that ought not to have been done, the way that we're going to make all things new is that we are going to act in high Anglican style. We are going to do it by the book. We have received a prayer of petition from the folks at St. James to be a mission station, the first step toward mission status. And the very Reverend Kelly Grace Kurtz and I are meeting next Tuesday with Canon Cindy Voorhees to discuss the next steps and answer all the questions that are pending about timing. Ever since the presiding bishop turn to your former coadjutor and to the standing committee to work on this subject, the Reverend Dr. Rachel Nyback has been an extraordinarily creative 
probing, thoughtful conversation partner for her colleagues on the Standing Committee, for Bishop Bruce, Canon McCarthy, Canon Williams, and me and all of us who have been engaged in this conversation. As part of the business of convention, the Standing Committee will elect a new president, and that president and the committee will play an absolutely critical role in the work that is to be done in the months, the weeks and months ahead as the proposal moves forward. Once restored, the congregation at St. James will share space with a Redeemer Center for Diocesan Ministry. All of this will happen side by side with a reconciliation process which is a serious and a thoroughgoing one as befits a division and a painful uh, split among the people of God that has preoccupied us for 28 wearying months. And tomorrow, Canada the Ordinary McCarthy, who has been working with the partners who we will bring in to do this work with us, will make a report to convention. Here's another way, though, to look at TLC, not as tender loving care, which goodness knows we all need, but as transparency, leadership, and community. Transparency, and I'm talking here about the financial kind, is being clear about what we have, clear about what we're doing with what we have, because what we have is by and large what has come from the people of God in this diocese now and in generations past. And then being absolutely clear about what we need to do the kind of ministry which we discern together needs to be done. You know from our August letter on Corp Soul that the Corporation Soul Committee and I have come up with a plan for reform of that somewhat mysterious institution in our diocese that is the subject of a resolution which will be put before convention tomorrow, calling on us to do the work by Pentecost of putting before the diocese the legislation that will be required to enact the reforms this time next year. To try to step a little bit onto Bishop Bruce's territory, I promise you on her behalf and all of our behalves, the 2019's Hungry Heart budget will show the true heart of the diocese. She'll talk more about her role in overseeing diocesan finances and budgeting during her address tomorrow. But if I may, I'd like to welcome among us, she is visiting our diocese with her beloved Sam, our newly appointed missioner for financial stewardship and CFO who will begin her work on December 18th in Echo Park. Please make welcome the Reverend Michelle Rackison. Hello, Michelle. On behalf of all of us, my thanks to Bishop Bruce for chairing the search committee, which resulted in the happy circumstance of Michelle being among us. Another thing I want to say, because I know it's a source of anxiety for many in the diocese, especially the last 28 months, and I say this with my hand on my heart, the last thing we want to do is sell any more churches. There are a number of ways that we're going to address this question. First of all, we are reorienting, reorienting our thinking about our missions and our mission centers as being not institutions in our church which are dependent upon the whole, but places where cutting edge, creative, risky ministry is being done. We're going to look to our missions and our mission centers for inspiration for all of us for the years ahead. And I have to be a bit realistic. We're not going to be saved in our diocese by some magical formula for 5% growth a year or 3.5% growth or 7% growth. That's not the way our God in Christ works. We'll be saved by continuing to do 
joyous gospel work of mission and ministry and love in the name of our risen Christ. So this afternoon we are asking each church and each institution in our diocese to live into, to adopt and then live into its own vision of sustainability so that when the moment comes we'll all be ready to be the church the world doesn't yet even realize it needs. And there are four steps in doing this work. The first is to honestly and realistically assess the way we're providing leadership in our churches and institutions. Is our leadership cheerful and optimistic? Are we being collaborative and faithful and non-anxious? I've added an adjective to this, curious, because I heard on NPR just yesterday that the social scientists have actually done a study and determined that if you ask a person a lot of questions about their life, they will like you better <laughs> than if you don't. Scientists are figuring out what churches that thrive have always known, that cur curiosity about the narratives that we bring to church from our disparate circumstances and lives to form the unity of congregations, when we're curious about each other's narratives, people feel at home and they love that place. It's impossible to generalize about our collective family Thanksgiving experiences. Reflect on Thanksgiving for a while, however you spent it and wherever you spent it. We all know what families that feel safe and welcoming and joyous and non-anxious feel like. We build churches that are the same way and we can't help but have the world come to our door because no other institution in 21st century America seeks to provide that kind of belonging. Second, simple question about meeting the needs of your neighborhood, your community, your stakeholders. How many of you have been on a Diane Jardine Bruce walkabout? Now, Bishop Bruce does this in the deaneries where she provides direct oversight. And as we move forward together in this new era, Diane will continue to cover deaneries one, two, eight, nine, and 10, which means I drew the inside straight in poker terms of three, four, five, six, and seven. So Diane can't come to every single church in the diocese and do a walkabout, but she can tell you how she does it. She, I can come to some. She can come to some, she can even come to a lot, but when you do a walkabout, you see your institution as your neighbors see it, and you always learn something new. Third, we need to continue to do our best to make good fiscal decisions. I had a friend from Nixon Library days and all he ever talked about was funded depreciation. Everything is eventually going to break down and need to be replaced and you need to put a little bit of money away every single year to fund your depreciation. And it's sometimes the last thing that we do in our institutions, especially those which are a bit on the margin budget wise, but you can put away $500, $300, $1,000, Dan Valdez knows what I'm talking about. Just do a little bit each year. And Bishop Bruce has again and again called my attention to the 2015 lay equity goals, which we have to work hard to meet as a diocese. We take these things seriously, making sure that lay employees are treated equitably compared to deacons, priests, and bishops when it comes to compensation. So there'll be more coming from Echo Park about that. At this time it is my duty to mention the names of churches that are three or more years behind on their audits and that list is a short one this year, St. Mark's Van Nuys and St. John Holy Child in Wilmington. 
fourth in my list of the search for local sustainability is to think big about repurposing underused buildings and property for the glory of God. If we're not going to sell churches, we need to turn churches into engines of glorifying God. And my list is partial. But churches inside the city of Los Angeles can tap into funds that Mayor Garcetti has made available for permanent supportive housing. Our friends at Episcopal Communities and Services who are displaying in the exhibit hall are looking for church properties, usually close to shopping, where they can come and build affordable housing for seniors, which could generate, depending on the number of units, up to $100,000 a year in lease payments to the church which is hosting the development and also give your congregation a whole new community of people to welcome and love. And if you want more details about that, just click on that link on the web page and you will find all the information you need about ECS. Neil Tadkin at St. Luke's Monrovia has been keeping me posted on his efforts and that of his fellow ministers to establish senior daycare at St. Luke's. There are partnerships already afoot at many of our churches with other faith communities. St. James South Pasadena Youth Center means that five days a week during the school year, the Reverend Ann Tumulty and her fellow ministers have got up to 70 middle schoolers using the church and glorifying God after school care is a way to serve Christ and also potentially generate some revenue. Many of our churches are removing their pews from St. John's Pro Cathedral to St. Aidan's in Malibu, which not only permits us to have more flexibility with worship, but makes our beautiful church spaces accessible to third-party organizations that want to come in and use them for banquets and yoga classes. I must say, at the virtue of embarrassing the Reverend Jamie Edwards Atkins, on a recent visit to St. Stephen's in Hollywood, where he has been the rector these 18 years, I was astonished at the energy and the variety of what the good people of St. Stephen's have going on. So I asked Jamie to send me a list of all of his revenue sources. There are 13 of them. Strap in. Here they come. Pledges and plate offerings, preschool tuition and fees, monthly parking rented to neighbors and neighboring businesses, event parking on our own and split with Hollywood parking services. Yes, folks, glorifying God by providing parking. Weekly rental of space to the Beechwood Children's Theater, monthly rental of space to Jubilee Consortium, which Jamie also serves as executive director in Mama's Medicine. Space for special events, birthday parties, quinceañeras, weddings, movie shoots, community group meetings, community garden produce sales, community garden seedlings to individuals and other community gardens, contracting administrative, custodial, and maintenance service to organizations and churches who can't afford to do those services on their own. Imagine that, sharing our expertise at church administration. Fundraisers, events and appeals, crowdfunding campaigns to help support the uh, uh, clergy, grants and corporate donations. Congratulations, Jamie and the people of St. Stephen's. You'll find that whole list as well on the resource page that we've put online. So that's transparency, work for us to do, work for all the people of God to do. Then there's in the TLC list, leadership. In other words, collegiality, collaboration, and communication. At the diocese we have in the Episcopal office, a, a certain Camp Stevens triad-like vision of collaborative servant leadership. Bishop Bruce, We'll talk tomorrow about the way Canon McCarthy, Bishop Bruce, and I will interact collaboratively. We don't always agree, often we don't, but we love each other and we believe in the community of three we have created. 
and against the backdrop of agape, we look forward to doing vigorous and creative work on your behalf. We've invited program groups and commissions to revision and revitalize, to use this time of transition to rebuild their ministries from the, from the ground up. The Commission on Ministry is taking a whole weekend in April to take a look at all of the work that it does for the glory of God. Under Canon McCarthy's leadership, we, we seek a revitalized role for all of our deanery deans as a council of advice for the bishop's office, meeting quarterly. We're beginning a conversation about how to bring new life to the reality, which is sometimes a confusing one, of having a cathedral presence in two places, St. John's Pro Cathedral, St. Paul's and St. Athanasius, and Echo Park. We're going to have a meeting next week and begin to work collaboratively to breathe new life into that seeming bifurcated cathedral unity. We're going to take a fresh look at how we operate diocesan convention. As brilliantly as this one is operated, thanks to Canon Wiley and her team, we do have in transition the opportunity to do some new thinking. So after the first of the year, look for a survey monkey, a survey monkey, asking you what you think about convention, where you'd like to meet, whether we might add some uh, programming that would look as much like a ministry fair as a diocesan convention, which many dioceses do. So be sure to let us know exactly what is on your mind. And we're also going to be promulgating, I believe for the first time at least in a little while, a two-year bishop's visitation schedule. Ken and Gail Urquidy has been working hard on this. It will go out before the end of the year. It's taking a little longer this year because she's planning not only for 2018, but also 2019. And then we'll be rolling forward so you'll always have 12 to 18 months notice on when the bishop is going to come calling. And we're very excited that our eloquent prophetic voice from today's Eucharist, Bishop Talton, We'll be doing some visitations for us once again alongside Bishop Bruce. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> alongside Bishop Bruce, Bishop Azariah, and her post St. James in the city discernment permitting, Bishop Catherine Roskin. And finally, on the TLC list is community, specifically a reconciled and recommitted diocesan family. I want to be a little bit cynical with you about financial transparency. We do it for its own sake, but we also do it because when we are transparent and absolutely clear, it then becomes much easier to ask for more money. So with reconciliation, the work that we'll do together in the model that Canon McCarthy will outline tomorrow, we will do for its own sake because we need healing for the sake of healing. But we'll also do it to discover a deeper sense of unity as a diverse and far-flung diocesan family. A little bit more about community, speaking about one community, you'll hear more from Bishop Bruce tomorrow about multicultural, multilingual ministry under the new rubric of one community. But I'll just go so far as to say that uh, like many communities like ours, which are broad gauge and pluralistic, we tend to celebrate our diversity without fully embracing it. And one of the things I've learned both working on the St. James the Great Matter on behalf of the presiding bishop along with Dr. Nybeck and the Standing Committee, and also from my visits around the diocese, uh, since early in the year is that there is, because of our small c congregational model, deep inequity in the way we fund parish and mission ministry. A couple of months ago at a diocesan council meeting she was chairing, Bishop Bruce said that there is a shameful correlation between the list of mission churches and the list of churches where English is not the primary language. 
we have a problem with privilege. And events in the broader culture in recent months have shown that we continue to have a problem with gender. This agonizing and liberating national reckoning invites us to reflect with a little bit of satisfaction on the broad array of Christendom around the world. Think how few Christians live under the authority of polity that honor the radical equality of women and LGBTQ people in sacramental life. So that is something that the world will be awaiting in the Episcopal Church when its gnawing spiritual hunger sends it back toward the divine. And because of what we're going through as a culture, this is a perfect time to do even more work. Because in the church, we have more work to do to make sure, for instance, that rector searches are broadly representative in terms of the names that are sent and the lists of finalists that we come up with. Canon Sartorius works hard on the first part, but sometimes it is in the nature of our institutions to tend to want to pick people who more or less work as we do. In the national scene, we have the continued shame that 5% of top CEOs are women, said the latest straight white male bishop of Los Angeles. A lot more work to do indeed. So pleased about the timeliness and prophecy of Bishop Carcano's eloquent lecture. But we know this for sure. We know it from the polling. We know it from our own children and grandchildren. We know it from our colleagues and friends. When hungry Gen Xers and hungry millennials, hungry Gen Zers, when they come looking for spiritual food, they're only going to want a church that is just. And we also have the opportunity, in talking about one community, for a renewed commitment to tried and true organizations, especially those that nurture women and young women, such as ECW and UTO. Be sure to look for the mite boxes that are out, Daughters of the King, Girls Friendly Society, from whom we've heard, and yes, even the Brotherhood of St. Andrew. You'll hear more about new community tomorrow, as I said, from Bishop Bruce, and then there's the issue of global community. The Reverend Pat O'Reilly, Troy Elder, and others on the program group on global partnership are among those rethinking their missions. And because of a misunderstanding of timing, a proposal from the Reverend Michael Cunningham and from the program group on a, program, a companion relationship with Maori Anglican Diocese in New Zealand did not reach the Committee on Resolutions on Time. So one hopes that we have it for the screen. Uh, we do that on the Committee on the Bishop's Address. Well, we don't look at it now? No, we do it. We don't look at it now. On the, Bishop's address. the vote will be called by the Committee on the bishop's address. And finally, communication is community. The Episcopal News needs your institution's email addresses. Put them on a spreadsheet. Do a screen grab with them and plop them in an email and send them to Canon Kawamoto so we can broaden to the full breadth and depth of the diocese, the people who get to read the excellent journalism that the Episcopal News creates. You can also sign up at the Episcopal News website and put in your addresses one by one. Canon Kamamoto also needs your story ideas. And the thing about social media, especially Facebook, which has kind of become the coin of the realm, it empowers each of us to be ecclesiastical citizen journalists. 
the things that happen in our churches might look old hat to you, but they look absolutely beautiful and edgy and exciting and colorful and mysterious to people who are hungry but might not know it yet. So spend your Sundays and Saturdays and your Bible study Thursdays taking everybody's pictures and making sure you have their names spelled right and putting it up on Facebook as though you were a reporter for the Episcopal News. It's easy, it's fun, it's liberating. And in the resource list we provided for you, you'll see a little guide I wrote some months ago about how to do that. We stop taking pictures of our margaritas and start taking pictures of our churches. And when you see something interesting about the Episcopal Church, share it. Click share so all of your friends will read it. A word, if I may, about Canon Bob Williams, who has been such a devoted colleague these, these months of getting acquainted with the new work that is before all of us in the Episcopal office. He twins passions and gifts for communications and for interfaith work. And working with the bishop's office, he's at work on new initiatives in both of those areas. And he's also providing leadership in our conversation about our new Cathedral Cooperative, and so it is my honor and pleasure to announce that Bob Williams, already a canon, is now in our diocese a canon for common life. Congratulations, Bob. As we fortify ourselves to be the church God's world needs, I want to stress three vital dimensions of our Episcopal identity. These are the things about which in our time and place the voice of the Spirit seems loudest. We are a church which embraces the eternal mystery of orthodox Christian belief. We proclaim Christ risen, Christ risen indeed. And our liturgies, as diverse as they are in our diocese, all of them in their ways are mysterious and beautiful and they speak to people as long as they pile glory upon glory and love upon love. It doesn't matter what language, it doesn't matter what Eucharistic prayer, what matters is that we're proclaiming the mystery of Christ crucified but in this time and place we match it to the radical egalitarianism of our Lord Jesus Christ without respect or division in terms of how any of us has been made by our Creator. We are all of us in our orthodox faith servants. We are basically deacons first, last, and always because Jesus told his followers that they would know who he was by the way he, by the way they served others. And so we're all of us called to be deacons to be servants. That universal ethic of agape, which has been our theme ever since Chet Talton's homily, is putting others always ahead of ourselves, and especially the dispossessed. Building on what Bishop Car Carcano has said, be sure to be on time for morning prayer tomorrow when the Reverend Francisco Garcia will, I guarantee you, lift the roof off of the Ontario Convention Center as he preaches prophetically about sacred resistance. Be here 10 o'clock sharp to hear Francisco Garcia. So that's the mystery piece. Second, we are a people in this time and place who prize interfaith and ecumenical literacy. What is the purpose of interfaith work? First of all, it is to combat scapegoating and make sure we understand those whom politicians would have us scapegoat. But it's also to magnify our gospel work by doing all we can to encounter the servant heart of other faiths and other denominations. And our third theme, lifetime spiritual development. We live in a time of increasing insecurity, 
impatience, polarization, anger, and we will be divided one against the other as these tendencies infect the church, which is a human institution. So each day, according to our personal, unique spiritual practice, we need to invite ourselves to model the peace of Christ in an era of chaos. Thus will each of us become the most attractive evangelical in our neighborhood because peace and non-anxiousness and love and acceptance are precisely what the world doesn't promote because nobody's found out how to make money off of them yet. The Reverend Michael Bell, who has been working hard on making sure that the CPE program at Good Samaritan Hospital survives the retirement of the legendary, the Reverend Canon Dr. Ronald David, is doing some fascinating work on how this clinical pastoral education model can be offered to the whole body of Christ as a key to discovering the peaceful non-anxiousness that lies within each heart to be deployed in the face of chaos. And again, to give you just a prelude of Bishop Bruce's address tomorrow, we're thinking about how to completely rethink and reshape our diocesan approach to theological education for lay people and for those in formation to be deacons and priests. So more about that tomorrow. So we heard this during our Eucharist service from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Think about how acutely relevant this is to the life that we're leading in this time and place. Since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. When we are discouraged and distracted, indeed we do not ever lose heart. We indeed refuse to practice cunning. We resolve to tell the truth face to face and to do the hard work of reconciliation with our siblings in Christ. By proclaiming these eternal truths that Christ is alive, that every risk for love, every risk of property and time and resources and treasure and emotional energy, every risk for love is absolutely safe in the resurrection by proclaiming that we indeed commend ourselves to everyone in creation, churched or not, faithful or not, knowing they're hungry yet or not. We commend ourselves as priests and prophets and practitioners of the great divine agape. And when we stumble, for we will, and when we get it wrong, because that's inevitable, let's just remember what that transformational Christian leader, that lifesaver, that redemption guru, founder of Homeboy Industries, Greg Boyle said recently, communion is not for perfect people. It's for hungry people. God bless the Diocese of Los Angeles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.